So that was a pretty exciting presentation right before me. <clears throat> I guess I came here to talk about all, uh, all the people whose jobs are going to be lost because of that technology. I think it's very promising. And I think the exciting future that we're coming into is going to be very, very strange and new. And we need to embrace it. But we also need to empower humans today with tools that can allow them to remain competitive in, in such a futuristic market. And that's kind of the, the premise of my speech. So I don't know about you, but I like being human. <clears throat> I'm also the CEO of an augmented reality technology company. So it's fair to say that I like technology as well. But more and more these days, it seems like these two ideals, being human and technological, are coming at odds with each other. So since uh, the year 2000, over 5 million jobs were lost to automation. So if you're looking for reasons for the political climate that we're in right now, it's probably because there are a lot of people without jobs that are pissed off. And that's about two times more jobs lost than China and Mexico combined, just for a, a reference point. Now, automation is kind of a deceptive term. We're not talking about some disembodied machine, uh, some, some crane that's assembling a car somewhere. We're talking about a growing body of machine intelligence that will soon replace your job and my job. Uh, and, and everyone's jobs if we will not uh, think about it together. And <clears throat> that's, what, uh, that's what I'd like to chat about today. Um, I have a bit of an unorthodox thesis as to why we're losing millions of jobs to robots right now. Uh, if you've heard uh, Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking, they say that this is because um, robots and AI are more intelligent than those humans that they're replacing. And I don't think that's true, at least not yet. I think the reason that we're losing to AI, we're losing our jobs to AI and, and robots right now is because we're using really, really crappy tools. I think we're trapping our work and our minds into an outdated model that was invented 50 years ago at Xerox Park of windows, icons, menus, and pointers. And it's holding us back. It's holding our potential back. Even your iPhone in your pocket is just that same model. It's, it's a window you can open. You can close it. You have a home screen with icons. And it's basically the same stuff that they were doing 50 years ago in terms of, uh, of our tools. So I think it's holding us back. And if you don't believe me, just think about me next time you're cramming your hopes and dreams into 140 characters. Right. So uh, about a year ago, <clears throat> I'm sorry, whether or not we're working in a corner office like I do or whether we're on a factory floor, our tools are holding us back, in my opinion. And our machine counterparts are running circles around us. It's kind of like we're coming to a uh, gunfight with a keyboard. But there is a silver lining, I think. I think that we can build much, much, much more powerful tools that can feel like an extension of the mind. And if we do so, then we will have a very big competitive leverage again. Um, we believe that instead of competing with machines, we can unify with machines. And we can combine the power of human creativity with the infinitude of the exponential nature of, of computers. And, uh, and that ideal drives me at Meta. And soon we'll see how augmented reality ties into this whole big picture. Last year, I, I gave a TED Talk. And um, I spoke about a future where not too long in the future, we'll have a strip of glass on our eyes that kind of looks like the glasses I'm wearing right now. Specifically in five years from TED of last year, uh, which is four years from today. Uh, Meta and Microsoft and Magic Leap, you may have heard of them, are all going to build this similar strip of glass, which kind of looks from a front profile like what I'm wearing right now. But in the back, you'll have some, some processing and some compute, et cetera. So all, everyone's working on that. But today, I came to talk about what future we would see through those glasses. 
and how that impacts the big picture story. Um, I think there are two, we're kind of at a crossroads, there's two kinds of futures where augmented reality can take us. And with the wrong future, don't get me wrong, this can actually be way more distracting and problematic than uh, today in terms of our, our current devices. Because when you surround yourself with holograms and panels and complexity, it's just an added layer of complexity, right? Um, but in the right kind of future, augmented reality fits you like a glove. It feels like it anticipates your instincts and needs at the right time, and it serves you information at just when you need it. So in, in a very deep way, augmented reality has the power to extend your mind. We, we believe in that second future, obviously. And uh, we call this the zero learning curve computer. We call this the, the zero learning curve computer because we have this idea at Meta, which is it's not the most powerful algorithm that's the most powerful tool, but it's the algorithm where you can reach out. It's a tool you can reach out and just use without even thinking about it. It's almost an unconscious, pro unconscious process. And when you do that, when you achieve the zero learning curve ideal for all of our tools, you can leverage really the algorithms behind them much more effectively. So that's our thesis. That's the zero learning curve computer. If you've seen in the VR industry tilt brush kids drawing in space, that's this zero learning curve ideal. OK. So how do we get there? Well, building a zero learning curve machine is much harder, much easier said than done. In fact, we've def or defined these days by our learning curves. Uh, we struggle with manu reading manuals, well, sometimes. Uh, we communicate with our thumbs. We look at um, icons that look really similar and try and understand the differences between them. This is our current state of affairs uh, of computing. This is the, the if you, you know, if you want to try a little exercise, pull out your phone for a moment, pull out your iPhones or whatever phone you have. Do this with me. It's a kind of a fun little thing. And go into your SMS and write and put your loved one in, a, in the field, in the box. And now, when I count to three, record them a quick voice memo and send it to them. One, two, three. The first person took 20 seconds. The second person took about, I just heard someone, 30 seconds. So it's a, it's a bit of a cumbersome process. Now, why is that? Um, on your SMS screen, you have a picture of a microphone. How many identical microphones exist on the most popular SMS app in the world? Can you guys see on the screens? Look at that. I mean, it's a pretty kind of mind-blowing fact when I discovered it. There's, there's two, right? So there's one in the, in, the, in the message box, and there's one on the bottom, and they have the same icon. I mean, isn't that insane that the most popular messaging app in the world has such visual ambiguity inside of it? And I think that's really what's, that's an embodiment of how crazy this whole uh, place we're in right now. So let's talk about, so that's, that's what I mean by learning curve. There's, there's just too much of it. Now, if we imagine that communicating with our machines is like uh, having a conversation with our devices, then the current way we're doing things has a very low bandwidth of communication. So we're able to harness our tools much less. And <clears throat> it's like a 56K modem uh, 10 years ago. I think that a good test of, of, of a zero learning curve, oh, a lot of people at this point say, you know, we've habituated to iPhones and Androids. They're really the easiest thing to use right now. But just because you can habituate to something doesn't mean it's naturally intuitive. You, you know, as a neuroscientist, I know that you can learn pretty much any interface with enough repetition. If you want a really good test for is something a zero learning curve UI, run a two-year-old child through it and run an 80-year-old person from another culture and see if they both get it in one trial. That's a real good tool in terms of its interface. And if you think that my standard is too high, you're kind of proving my point, which is we've become accustomed to cumbersome user interfaces, things that are too hard to operate. And that's what we believe the, 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 the next uh, 
evolution has to be. Another thing people sometimes say when you simplify computing to a hologram that you can pick up and you know, use as a tool is that you lose all the power user functionality. I don't think so. I think if you think about a lasso uh, that cowboys use, this is an example of a 3D tool. It's a rope with a, with a loop that's very powerful, very, very complex. Um, and, and it's just simple to, to understand, to grasp. Another one is a power user drill, for example. Right? A drill, is, is its form implies its function, so it's fairly easy to understand how to use it. Or how about a steering wheel? So I'm driving in many different speeds, and I'm able to navigate through the cars effectively using just a, a wheel. And these are kind of examples of tools that allow for a lot of complexity, but I don't think that they're too hard to grasp. Uh, <clears throat> the power of augmented, so I'm here to talk about AR, and this is a story about humanity, but how, does it, how do they connect? AR allows you to build 3D tools for the first time. It allows you to build your tools like those examples of those three very easy to understand and easy to operate tools. And um, it's like our 3D holographic tools catch up to our, the world of our instincts, the 3D world. And that's the power of it. In a, in, a, in a kind of an interesting way, AR is the most modern technology. It's going to replace our iPhones in not too long in the future. But it's uh, the first technology that a caveman is likely to understand, you know, because you and that caveman have the same ability, the same instinct to reach out and grab something. So uh, we're really excited by that promise of augmented reality. Cool. So I want to paint two futures for you today, and then we're going to wrap up. Future number one is what happens if we don't change anything and we just keep our current world of computing into the future. So I promised you that by M March, May 2021, uh, four short years from today, we would build a strip of glass that projects photorealistic imagery onto your eyes. Now let's imagine how we would use it. So you wake up in your bed in, in 2021 and you roll over. And much to the dismay of the Apple shareholders, there's no iPhone there. And instead, you pick up your strip of glass, and you put it on. And immediately, you have a Windows Start menu pop in front of your face with icons and, and such. And your wife sends you a, uh, a pop-up message that comes in front of your face, remember to buy eggs, honey, on the way to work. And you're sort of focusing your eyes into your day, and you're trying to remember how do I get rid of this pop-up? So you swipe at it, and it doesn't go away. And you try and remember the gesture for getting rid of this particular pop-up, this particular menu. And you think it's something like this pinch gesture, which uh, is what a lot of AR companies are, are looking into now. And so you do that, and you accidentally open a browser panel over here, which is showing you your YouTube video from the previous day. You're looking at a cat video, and it's a little too loud for your morning. Uh, routine, and so this clutter is coming at you, and you don't know how to close it. Um, so you remember that the way that you close a start menu on Windows is by doing a gesture of a blooming flower, and that's how you uh, get rid of that menu. Okay, you manage to clear it out. You decide that you'd keep the cat video because it's kind of an, uh, a fun thing, and you wake up and start your day. So you walk towards your refrigerator and towards the exit of your home with this cat video, and you accidentally stub your toe in the refrigerator and, because you're focused on this panel. And then you get out towards work. And you look at your time, and it's, uh, you're five minutes late for work. You get an Uber. You get to work. And you had just gotten this job on the factory floor a few months ago. And it has about 100 different power users, menus, and shortcuts that you have to remember to operate an entire set of machinery in the factory. And you can only struggle to remember about 30% of, of it when your boss comes behind you and says, hey, buddy, it looks like you're, uh, you're a little late there, and it looks like you're struggling with uh, the machinery. But inside their mind, they're thinking that a machine can probably operate other machines a lot more effectively. And promptly, what does he do? What does he do? He fires you. That's the end of future number one. Okay? Admittedly, this kind of a cartoonish, exaggerated example of, of the future. But if you look at uh, some of the AR competitors that, we're, that we have, everything that I said in this story is exactly how you operate their tools. 
Uh, there's, no, there's no exaggeration in that sense. So let's go to future number two, and then we'll wrap up. You're in March 2021. You roll over your bed. You pick up your strip of glass. You put it on, and nothing happens. Then you go to the corner of your bed, and you look out the window, and you meditate, and nothing happens. No, nothing comes into your face. And so you go out to the refrigerator, and you, you're heading out the door to start your day, and there's a holographic sticky note on the refrigerator left by your spouse telling you to buy eggs on the way out, and you have a photorealistic image of this eggs, <laughs> so you don't forget which brand she likes. And you take these two things, and you put them in a holographic tool belt, and you go out and uh, you start your day. Now, with the extra 15 minutes you've gained from not having a frustrating morning experience of cognitive over overload and computing interfaces, you decide that you're going to go for a run around Crystal Lakes. I don't know if you guys know Crystal Lakes. It's the most beautiful uh, lake around here. Um, and I go running sometimes there. So uh, you go to this run, and you start running around the lake. And you see this beautiful flower that kind of grabs your interest. And <clears throat> you touch it. And right next to it, you get a panel that says how much DNA you share with this flower. Turns out that you share 70% of it, uh, which is a true fact, by the way, I'm certain pieces of flowers. And that kind of gives you a little smile, and you keep running. And then you see at a distance as you're uh, someone who you barely recognize, but as their face comes into focus, you get a panel between you that says that we went to the same Harvard Business School class, and we both like the Grateful Dead. And so by the time that you cross paths with them, you know, by the time you get past them, you reach out your hand, and we're Facebook friends, but nothing else happens, and you keep running down the road, right? So this is a, a beautiful example of what I think the highest calling for augmented reality really is. It's to deepen the connection with the real world and other people in the real world and make computing life more easy and less in your face. Um, and I think that's the real uh, beautiful thing that we can achieve. But I digress. You get to work, right? That's what we're talking about today, work and jobs. And when you get to work, you have an interface, you have an app, a tool on your table that looks like little holographic Lego blocks. And they're controlling your factory floor. So you have a boiler on one side, you have a crane on the other side that is uh, uh, on your factory floor. And then you have these little miniature toys almost, holographic toys. And you know exactly how to control them because you have all the instincts to do so. So your boss comes behind you and they see you mastering this floor because it works the way your brain does. And what do they say? They say, pretty good job. You know, you're, you're getting a promotion. So that's the end of our second story of the future of how we can, uh, we can uh, evolve, co-evolve with our machines. So this leads me to the next 50 years, and this is the next, the last paragraph I will say. In the first 50 years of computing, it honestly didn't matter that we were using crappy tools uh, because we're only competing with each other. We're competing with other humans. And <clears throat> the worst thing that can happen from a, from a, from a clumsy tool is a, a little bit of user frustration. But in the next 50 years, when we have those kinds of drones that we saw in our previous talk, uh, and we have self-driving cars that will obviate every Uber driver, in the nation and so forth. When we have this new challenge, uh, we have to step up our game with our tools, we believe. And the world is changing fast, and we're about to face this form of competition unlike any humanity has ever seen before. Intelligent machines are uh, raising to take the, they're raising the stakes on productivity even as we speak, and they're coming after all of our jobs. Um, even if it seems like a silent thing right now that's happening with cars, it is going to influence all of us. And so I hope that through the lens of augmented reality and the next generation of computers, we can begin to build tools for the first time that extend the human, that wrap around the human, versus us having to wrap around our tools and learn to talk the way they talk. So that's my speech. Thank you.